Well, hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with Jack Elsom, chief political correspondent of The Sun, and Zoe Grunewald, political correspondent at The Independent. Welcome to both of you. So to the front pages then, let us take a look at uh, what is the lead story. For Zoe's paper, The Independent, picturing the devastation in Khan Yunus in Gaza after the Israeli army suddenly pulled out and calls it the picture that cries out, agree a ceasefire now. The Guardian says that Keir Starmer is pledging to revive the early years Sure Start programme to help the country's poorest families. While The Times says he's also planning to close the remaining loopholes in the laws on non-dom tax status. The Metro reporting that chemical toxins, which take hundreds of years to break down, have been discovered in fruit, veg and spices on sale in British stores. The Daily Express leads with calls to make it easier and less stressful for cancer patients to travel to treatment centres a long way from their homes. The Daily Mail has a new report which reveals that a record number of what it calls fat cats are being paid over £150,000 a year by local councils. Jack's paper The Sun has news of boxer Ricky Hatton's romance with actor Claire Sweeney. Well, the star tells us that some Oxford scientists think camels should replace cows because they produce a lot less greenhouse gases. Don't forget to scan the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme. You can then check out the front pages for yourself of tomorrow's papers while you listen to our guests. Let's head to Jack Elsom then and Zoe Grunewald. Welcome to you. And kicking off, actually, with a story in your paper, Cam in Florida to meet Trump. Tell us more. Yes, this is a story um, just breaking tonight in The Sun. Um, David Cameron, Foreign Secretary, uh, is flying to Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's uh, Florida residence, to hold talks with uh, the man who, this time next year, could be in the White House. We know he's sort of uh, going on, David Cameron, for a sort of a whistle-stop tour uh, of Washington uh, tomorrow to sort of lobby um, American leaders about uh, the situation in Ukraine. And this is $60 billion worth of aid, which is currently uh, being deadlocked in the House of Representatives. Um, a key linchpin of that, I think, is seen as Donald Trump, who obviously holds immense sway um, with Republicans in the House. And so before he goes to uh, DC tomorrow, David Cameron is making a pit stop at Florida uh, to meet Donald Trump. Um, although, I'll tell you what, to be a fly on the wall uh, in that meeting is going to be quite something, given the comments uh, Lord Cameron has made about Donald Trump in the past. Uh, he called him protectionist, uh, xenophobic and misogynistic. And so let's hope the uh, famously thin-skinned uh, ex-president, maybe future president, uh, hasn't read them before the meeting. Yes, those in his memoirs, before you realise you're coming back into office. Yes. You be careful what you say, <laughs> don't you, certainly. Um, but Donald Trump, of course, facing his first uh, of these big cases. He's in a, a bid today, once again, in the US courts to delay that failed. So, uh, you know, Trump, Trump's a busy man, let's put it that way. Yeah, he's got plenty going on. And, of course, at the end of it, he's hoping he'll be president again. Um, as you say, he's got a raft of, of, of court cases, legal battles to deal with. Um, and we're still seeing he's obviously being engaged with uh, Western leaders in diplomacy as well. Um, while all this domestic politics about Donald Trump and the presidency is rumbling on in the US, of course, on the wider international stage, we have two really big conflicts in the Middle East and in Ukraine. And they still very much set the backdrop for not only um, the actions of the West, but what exactly the Republican Party will take as it stands to international issues next year. We know there is a big caucus in the Republican Party Party, who are quite isolationist, um, don't really, you know, we've, there's been lots of conversation about uh, the US's relationship with NATO. So I think this, yeah, this would be a really interesting conversation. And David Cameron, who is this very kind of international One Nation Conservative up against Donald Trump. It's just a very interesting um, vision of what uh, these two nations might look like come November. Yes, um, as PM in 2016, he called Mr Trump divisive, stupid and wrong to continue the awkwardness. Uh, we have had a statement from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office confirming your story, or Harry Cole's story, or political mm -hmm. editor's story. This meeting follows standard practice for engagement between ministers and opposition candidates of partner nations. For example, in Feb this year, uh, Anthony Blinken met... Sir Keir Starmer, for example. Uh, but it will be fascinating, won't it? So ahead of his visit to Washington, the Foreign Secretary will meet former President Trump in Florida today. Do you know what time that meeting is so we can... Uh... 
follow it more closely? Uh, pre presumably uh, in the next few hours. Um, I think he flew um, earlier earlier this evening. Mm. Um, you know, it, I think it'd be quite remiss. Obviously, no matter how many how much uh, politicians in the UK might not want to accept uh, potential reality of Donald Trump becoming president, like he's an awkward customer. He probably couldn't be more opposite mm. to David Cameron. He's quite mild mannered. Uh, you know, Trump shoots from the hip in all sorts of diplomatic um, affairs. Um, but they're going to have to get used to it because you know he is polling very high. He could well be in the White House this time next year. Um, and I think that you know for the nation's top diplomat. That. It's obviously important as the British government to build bridges. OK, fascinating. We will await the photo if it is released. Um, in the meantime, let's take a look at the front of The Independent, the picture that cries out, agree a ceasefire now. Fascinating what's happening with Israeli troops pulling out of uh, southern Gaza. And yet, Benjamin Netanyahu still says about the Rafa offensive, there is a date for it. Mm. Yeah, and I think this is the, you know, this the last week or so has seemed like a real tipping point in support from the West for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's offensive in Palestine, the images coming out of Palestine of the, like this picture in The Independent, of the level of destruction of the, you know, 33,000 people dead, um, the, the level of uh, pure conflict in South Gaza itself, and of course the, the killing of three aid workers. Um, and, and, and on the back of that now, the West is really seeming to put more pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu to explain what exactly he wants to get out of this conflict. If indeed he does complete his stated aim of wiping out Hamas, what does that mean for, for Palestine? And you know, you see here people returning to their city and it's just absolutely devastated. So the question is, what is going to come out of this conflict at the end of it. And indeed, will it, will it be worth it if millions of people are displaced, hundreds of thousands, you know, are, are harmed, thousands are, are murdered? It just, it just feels like the war is really becoming harder and harder to justify. Mm. And we've had the warning, haven't we, from Joe Biden towards Netanyahu. We've had the horror at the killing of those aid workers last week. You know, do you, do you sense a shifting of the sands now, do you think, in uh, what might happen next? Yeah, totally. And those Western allies who, after October 7th, um, came out staunchly in support of Israel, and I think are finding it incredibly tough to do so now. And, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu earlier, um, when he spoke, said um, exactly what he said at the start, and that we are going to be going into Rafa because we need to do that to flush out what remains of Hamas. And I think that, you know, Western allies would agree with that. However, if it hadn't been for what we've seen before, because, you know, for the past six months, he has said exactly the same thing. We are doing this military operation to flush out Hamas. Um, and what have we seen? You know, as Zoe said, we've seen, you know, maybe 30,000 people dead. We've seen homes uh, destroyed, as pictured on the front of, uh, of the Independent today. Um, and so, you know, as Zoe said, you know, there seems to be running out of road now when it comes to justifications for this. And why is the attack on Rafa, also the invasion, the ground invasion of Rafa, where there's about what, 1. 4 million people who are currently displaced. Why is that going to be any different and any more uh, careful than the past six months, what we've seen? Yes, the statement from uh, Mr Netanyahu, this victory requires entry into Rafa and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. Mm. Uh, but uh, the Israeli government spokesman today pointing out that 604 Israeli soldiers have also lost their lives. Mm. So there's pressure mm. within, from within as well, isn't mm. there? Um, let's go to uh, some politics, shall we? Mm. Front of the Times, first of all. Labour set to those non-DOM loopholes. We know non-DOM stuff is in their <laughs> sites anyway. So what's new about this, Zoe? So uh, this is about Labour now plugging the gap that the con slightly complicated the Conservatives stole their non-DOM policy, uh, which was very frustrating for Labour because um, they it's the only bit of spending they'd really earmarked and they were going to pay for the NHS and breakfast clubs and, and various things with this. But now, because the Conservatives sort of took, took their plans from them, uh, Labour have been faced with trying to get that money from elsewhere. And essentially now Labour have said they're going to plug the gap that the Conservatives have left by closing a loophole that gives non-DOM until April next year to put overseas funds, overseas funds into a trust. So that basically means they're going to try and get ahead of any of those non-DOMs who may help to put their money elsewhere. Um, and there's a few other things that Labour have announced as well. So they, they want to raise a further £5 billion by closing other tax loopholes by making uh, it easier for HMRC to enforce compliance. Uh, they say that, you know, that they do believe that people do want to uh, pay the right amount of tax, but sometimes, as we know, HMRC can be uh, quite difficult to deal with. So they want to make it a lot easier for people to do that. And they think by doing that, um, they'll be able to generate this revenue now. 
it will be up to the OBR, it'll be up to everyone else to decide whether that really is the case, if you can really get five billion out of that. Um, but Labour seem pretty confident that they'll be able to do this. It feels part of the electoral cycle. I feel like I hear this every time, to be fair, actually. You know, a squeeze here mm. and a squeeze there. It's a lot of money, though, five billion, isn't it, to squeeze out of this? Labour set to close non-dom loopholes, two billion more a year sought for schools and NHS. The point is, spending is required. That's the thought, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You have to spend money to get money, I think is what Labour is saying. You know, they're going to put £555 million pounds into HMRC in order to try and claim what, five billion what? back, yeah, I think so, uh, into sort of like the resourcing of them to go <laughs> after tax dodgers and the sort of the tax gap between the tax money you actually should take and the tax you actually take. Um, like Zoe said, it'd be interesting to see what the OBR makes of these sums. You know, Rachel Reeves has been very um, prudent in terms of making the sums add up. Five billion pounds, though, in lost tax. You would have thought that, you know, when they were going through these sums before, ahead of the budget, until the Tories nicked their ideas, they might have stumbled across this. It does seem a bit flimsy. Five billion pounds over five years, you're clawing back in lost tax. And, you know, why haven't they thought of that earlier? And the Tories today saying they've actually put in place more than 200 measures since they've got back in uh, to try and reclaim um, uh, uh, lost tax. Um, the proof will be in the pudding whether this actually works. Mm. You know, more evidence of a, a government in waiting. The Guardian also leading on prospective policies for um, Sir Keir Starmer. Mm. Uh, he's been told to resurrect the Sure Start programme to help the poorest, and this is because a study showed that it really does boost academic attainment, Zoe. Mm. Yeah, so um, what's really interesting about Keir Starmer is he's still surrounded by former Labour secretaries of state, former Labour advisers from the Blair and Brown years. And one of the things they do talk about quite a lot is the success of Sure Start. So they say it really did help to uh, support disadvantaged families. It linked the community together. It was one of those sort of communitarian Labour, new Labour policies. Um, and I think they, they, they're all putting a fair amount of pressure on Keir Starmer to reignite some form of Sure Start programme. So, yeah, now we're hearing that Labour's, Labour may well be considering it. And there is this kind of increasing pressure on the party to think about their approach to social mobility, to think about how how they're going to re-engage communities, um, relink all these services and give children a better start in life because actually social mobility is a big part of what Labour wants its offering to be. Um, so this could really be, I think we could see something like Sure Start as the backbone of Labour's social mobility programme. And The Guardian saying that research by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows for the first time how the programme generated significant improvement in the academic attainment of children from low-income background years later on, suggesting that those who had access to Sure Start or free school meals got GCSE equivalents boosted by three grades. I mean, this, that's quite big, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's pretty extraordinary. And, you know, it does speak to, I think, the uh, broad success. I think universally recognised the Sure Start uh, scheme. And I think the Tories would say that their family hub you know, a bit of a rebrand of Sure Start really would probably, you know, carry on that legacy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think all parties really agree that, you know, if you get in there young and you give people the proper training and, you know, give their families um, the, right, uh, the right support as well, then obviously, you know, you're going to get better educational attainment at the end of it. Yeah, I mean, it's so associated with Gordon Brown, you know, the, yes. the, the criticism... Everyone's that, coming out of the woodwork, that, Well, the <laughs> Sikir Starmer is like Blair Light or New Labour Light, you know, that he goes back to those days. Mm. Is that something he's trying to avoid? I don't know. Well, I, I think <laughs> um, what's quite interesting is I think the Labour Party has split between kind of the Brownites and the Blairites quite a bit again? now. Again? Um, we, we, we do, we do, see, we do, yeah, well, again, exactly. Um, but we do see these voices like David Blunkett, you know, they're seen as trusted advisors to the Labour Party. And I think actually Starmer and his leadership team do take a lot of advice from them because, you know, people do look at Tony Blair and think he was a very successful, influential Prime Minister, in, especially in the early years. OK, lots more still to come uh, in the next part of our programme. Could we soon be drinking... Camel's milk, she says, <laughs> on our breakfast cereal uh, instead of regular milk from cows. Just checking, I was looking at that correctly. Uh, all that and more after the break. Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Jack Elsom, chief political correspondent of The Sun, and Zoe Grunewald, political correspondent at The Independent. Welcome back to both of you. So I'm going to read the first part of this top story in The Times. Uh, accommodation in Rwanda earmarked for migrants has been sold off to local buyers after setbacks delayed Rishi Sunak's small boats policy. 
Is it, does it mean it's toast then, Jack? You've been there, haven't you? I have been to this exact, um, exact uh, housing estate where migrants were earmarked to go once the scheme was up and running. Um, yeah, it is a setback. Um, these houses, um, I went there with Svella Bravman, the then Home Secretary, mm. and they were sort of touted as really nice accommodation, affordable accommodation, which migrants who we would send uh, to Rwanda under the, um, under the Migration Partnership um, would be able to rebuild their lives. Um, we've now found out that um, of the 173 homes here, 70% have actually now been sold to other locals. And so this scheme is meant to be uncapped, OK, so where are they going to go? But also, it might speak to the fact that Rwanda are just getting a bit impatient and a bit bored of waiting for this. I mean, this scheme was first announced in 2022, and now it's, you know, almost two years later, and we haven't sent a single person apart from uh, three home secretaries and a bunch of journalists, including myself. And I have to say, actually, the homes were quite nice. We went out of there. And as the Times makes clear today, um, Svella Bravman said that she loved the interior design uh, when she was there. So, which someone else is now living in. Which someone else is now there. Yeah. Um, two stories in, it looks like your column in The Sun. I'm going to get Zoe to do the first of them, mm. which is William Ragg, the Tory MP at the centre of a blackmail... Well, sexting... Uh, that's the different one, actually. There we go. Let's do that one first. Uh, sexting row has quit uh, his prestigious party roles... Uh, we've heard tonight. Yes, so he's uh, quit as deputy chairman of the 1922 committee and this is obviously following uh, the uh, honey trap scandal that came to light last week which it seems like almost every single male political journalist in Westminster apart from Jack <laughs> for some reason has been involved in. Um, it's it, it, it's just a really extraordinary story about um, I guess the the importance of cybersecurity and being really careful as to who you send things to online, especially if you've not met them in person. Um, and I think this is. I mean, I th was speaking to MPs last week. I think there was a general sense that nobody really thought a by-election um, or, or removing the whip from William Rag was in the interest of the party. He's already set to step down in six months, um, it, and I think some people do see him as a victim of a blackmail scam as well. Um, but it, it was quite clear that his position as deputy chairman of the 1922 this the committee that is in charge of backbench MPs for the Conservative Party was possibly under question because when you have a scandal like this it's really hard to maintain the authority but, but it's also quite hard to see how an MP who's setting online safety rules for the rest of us, you know, continues in this fashion. Mm. Anyway, we'll park that one, go to the other story that you've, uh, you've written, which is about Angela Rayner. So Keir Starmer today says no one cares, but, but um, well, your paper does, or you do. Tell me more. I think a lot of people care. And I think that um, Angela Rayner, you know, as, as, as try as hard as they might uh, labour for this to go away, I don't think it is. And that's because um, Angela Rayner still hasn't answered basic questions about, uh, about this scandal. First of all, the initial um, capital gains tax and the um, you know, discrepancies over the properties, um, but also the story in which she has since told, which, you know, appears to be um, uh, you know, contested, at least, by photographs um, which emerged in the Mail on Sunday... Um, over the weekend, and you know, for Keir Starmer to try and brush this away, and I, th I think the language he said today was, um, you know, people are much more interested in uh, A&E waiting times. Well, that is probably true, but you know, you're going to potentially be the next government. You can't just say that you're going to dodge scrutiny on something which is quite serious because there are other bigger issues. No, of course there are, but you know, this scrutiny is only going to uh, intensify going up to the election. And I think it'll be in the interest now, both Keir Starmer, uh, who has gone out to bat for her, despite not seeing this legal advice, so we don't really know why, um, and Angela Rayner, to put this, uh, put this to bed. And, you know, the uh, easiest way to do that is just to publish this uh, advice, which she says exonerates her. Uh, other big issue, bigger issues included the Daily Star's front. Boffs give cows the right hump. Uh, we should all be drinking camel's milk. Running out of time to talk about it, <laughs> because they... What's another word for that word there? Boffs. No. no. The other word. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they excrete more, less. Oh, anyway, you yes. know that word. Oh. That word. They guff. Yes. They guff. <laughs> they guff. That's it. That's better. Thank you very much indeed. It's better than the word they used anyway. Anyway, I do read that actually camel's milk is abundant in vitamin B and C mm. and minerals such as calcium, iron, zinc, folate, and potassium. A great source of long chain and unsaturated fatty acids. Camel's milk supports brain and heart health. I'm going to leave it there. I've got time to talk about it anymore. <laughs> uh, we'll see if that develops any further. Uh, Jack and Zoe, great to see you both. Thank you very much indeed.